I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we're starting a new book, 10.1, Adam from the Son of Knowledge, by Lex Hickson Nur al-Jarahi. Table of Contents Preface, Contents and Purposes, Introduction, Four Steps and Seven Levels Part 1, Traditional Islamic Resources 1. Affirmation of Unity 2. Zalat 3. Mevlut 4. Heart of the Holy Quran 5. Islamic Meditations 6. Salawat and Hadith 7. Lightning Flashes 8. Three Days of Prayer 9. The Generosity of Allah 10. Munajat Part 2. Sufi Inspirations 11. Leap of the Dervish 12. Circle of Encounter 13. Countenance and Heart of the Sheikh 14. New Light on Sufi Science and 15. Perfect Humanity The Index Preface Friday Noon Prayer is the central focus of the Islamic Week. When Prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace, spiritually addresses his global community through the beloved imams, the knowledgeable leaders of prayer. My beloved Sheikh Mufazir Ashki al-Jarahi of Istanbul used to introduce his talks on such solemn occasions with these powerful words. I am presenting here simply an atom from the sun of knowledge, a drop from the ocean of knowledge. I once dreamed of my noble sheikh, dressed regally in robes and turban, speaking from a beautiful wooden minbar, the pulpit of the Messenger of Allah, located in every holy mosque on the planet. Four Quranic chanters, who were his dervishes, stood around the bottom step of the pulpit. Esoterically interpreted, these were the Prophet Muhammad and his four rightly guided successors, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. This dream demonstrates how the original community of Islam, now apparently separated from us by 14 centuries of linear time, is mystically replicated during each successive generation by authentic sheikhs and their loyal dervishes. I am a Western-born, liberally educated, with sound background in Greek, European, and Indian philosophy, as well as in several religious traditions. In the Islamic year 1400, which was 1980 of the Common Era, I became one of the formal successors of Muzahafar Efendi. I knelt before him side by side with my spiritual sister, Fariha al-Jarahi, at the Mosque of Divine Ease, the Masjid al-Farad, in New York City. After placing his magnificent green and gold turban upon my head, the Grand Sheikh opened his palms and offered this supplication. May whatever has come into me from Allah and from the Prophet of Allah now enter into him. After this brief prayer, Sheikh Muzaffar removed his turban from my head and placed it on the western woman beside me. I would have enjoyed wearing it longer, but spiritual transmission, like turning on an electric light, is instantaneous. Adam from the Son of Knowledge is a verbal expression of the ineffable light that flowed into my being during that moment. This mysterious illumination has been raining down within me ever since, from the green turban of Nuruddin Jarahi, the light of universal religion who lived 300 years ago in Istanbul. My sheikh, Muzaffar Effendi, was 19 in his line of successors. These writings have manifested through inspiration, combined with literary effort, during the 11 years since this transmission took place. Many of them were composed during the holy month of Ramadan, fasting from sunrise to sunset, feasting and praying until one hour before the first light. This collection represents only a fraction of the spontaneous teachings that the author has presented orally during the 11 years of his responsibility as a Sufi guide, who is a friend to souls and an interpreter of dreams. Combined with its companion volume, Heart of the Quran, published in 1988, this work presents a comprehensive mystical interpretation of Islam. These contemporary writings of a Western initiate are deeply rooted in the authentic traditions of the ancient dervish orders of the East where for many centuries both Muslim men and Muslim women with social and familial responsibilities have been attaining the highest realization, mystical union with supreme reality. 
These compositions can be tasted like nectar by the soul, and tested like gold in the fire of the heart's longing and sincerity. Such teachings belong only to limitless truth. They are not confined within any limited context of understanding, including that of the author. The mystical writings collected here are not personal, but represent the universal gift of an unbroken spiritual transmission covering 14 centuries, beginning with the Messenger of Allah in the desert of Arabia. This lineage does not, strictly speaking, originate with the Prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace, since he considered himself a humble inheritor of the vast spiritual wealth of Adam, Noah, Abraham, J Isaac, Ismail, Jacob, Joseph, Solomon, David, Moses, and Jesus, upon them all be peace. In another sense, however, this prophetic wealth is the lineage of Nur Muhammad, the Muhammadan light, parallel to the Christian teaching of the Logos. In the Gospels, the beloved Jesus proclaims, Before Abraham was, I am. In the Hadith, or oral tradition of the Prophet, the beloved Muhammad announces from the same ecstatic level of conscious oneness, I was a prophet when Adam was still between water and clay. These contemporary writings flow through the blessings of the sublime Ali, May Allah eternally enlighten his countenance, and his wife Fatima the Illumined, the magnificent daughter of the Prophet, and their sons Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, as well as the entire line of twelve noble descendants of Muhammad. These writings are infused with the mysterious blessings of the four central poles of Sufism, Sayyid Ahmad Rufai, Sayyid Ahmad Badawi, Sayyid Sultan Abdul Qadir Galani, and Sayyid Ibrahim Dusuki. These writings are fundamentally indebted to the great woman of Islam, who opened wide the path of lover and beloved, the noble Rabia al Adawiya. May her secret be sanctified. The atmosphere of these writings is permeated, as is all mystical thought and experience in Islam, by the spiritual presence of the king of lovers, Mansur al Halaj, the king of Gnostics, Bayazid Bistami, and the master of sobriety, Junayad al Baghdad. May their astonishing spiritual secrets remain well guarded. Also present through these writings are the sublime Gnostic saints Munadin Shisti and Shah Naqshiband and their formal successors. Into these two noble lineages as well, the present author has received initiation. These writings fly on two wings of Sufism, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi and Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi. May their spirits be sanctified. Finally, every movement of heart and mind expressed in these pages was kindled by the cupbearer of divine love for all humanity, Sultan Muhammad Nuruddin Jarahi, the founding peer of my order. Nuruddin Jarahi carefully carried on the initiatory line of the Kalwatis, established in Anatolia and settled in Egypt some 700 years ago. He gathered together the global riches of Sufism and was recognized by his contemporaries through spiritual dreams as the axis and seal of love. Whatever purity or sincerity is expressed through these writings is the gift of Allah through the intercession of Pir's noble mother, Amina Taslima. That the book exists at all is due to the blessings of Allah flowing through the prayers of the modern successor to Nareddi Jarahi, my sheikh, Muzaffahir Ashki, who came to America in 1978 and infused us with a new sense of love and responsibility. He brought with him to New York City the blue sheepskin of Pir Nuradin, which had never left the Dervish Lodge in Istanbul. I accompanied Muzaffar Effendi on his 11th and final pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina in 1980. Yet during the last seven years of his life, this great lover traveled 14 times to New York City, having fallen in love with the open heart of America. Evidently, the Grand Sheikh found here in the West a greater spiritual priority for his life than in the holy cities of Arabia and the East. How can I describe 11 years as spiritual guide to various dervish communities in the United States and Mexico? This communion of hearts and minds generated the writings collected here. Each selection the author composed for a certain community, read aloud to that community, discussed and elucidated in the sacramental presence of that community, and revised in the light of such discussion. So many of my personal and cultural assumptions and those of my friends in the Jirahi order, both Eastern and Western by birth, have been discarded or transformed. We have made, and must continue to make, subtle adjustments between what is appropriate for traditional Islamic order in the ancient East and what is appropriate for mystical association of liberal-minded persons in the modern West. Muslim by birth, Muslim by adoption, Jewish, Christian, Baha'i, Sikh, Hindu, Buddhist, Native American, and non-traditional. We continue to operate, however, with the blessing, guidance, and permission of the present Grand Sheikh of the Jirahi Order, Sefer Effendi of Istanbul. 
The history of our community formation will make a significant study sometime in the future. The maturing process in a dervish order is communal. The mystical ascension into paradise consciousness and beyond into the garden of essence occurs hand in hand, hearts intertwined eternally. Meeting on Thursday nights for Takir, the dynamic circle of divine remembrance, we encounter each other primarily as aspiring souls and only secondarily as personalities with psychological and sociological profiles. The living spiritual documents in this book belong to the landscape of the soul. They cannot remain fixed within any personal cultural, historical, or religious framework. They are the very energy of essential reality. My only prayer is that the writings gathered here will provide an opportunity for further elevation to the sincere hearts of readers from whatever traditional or non-traditional perspective they may come. Whether Adam from the Son of Knowledge can also contribute to greater planetary appreciation and understanding of the noble way of Islam rests in divine foreknowledge alone. Lex Nixon, Nur al-Jarahi, Majid al-Farah, 1992, 1413 in the Islamic calendar. Contents and Purposes The introduction to this book, Four Steps and Seven Levels, establishes that the author is not operating as a Western intellectual, but as a sheikh in the lineage of ancient dervish order, speaking authentically from that living ground. His teaching function is initiatory transmission rather than scholarship. Adam from the Son of Knowledge is not a speculative reinvention of tradition, but embodies the continuity of Islamic faith and practice. Islam, in all its richness, is expressed here through a contemporary mind educated in the precincts of liberal secular humanism, as Moses was raised in the palace of Pharaoh. The book is divided into two sections, traditional Islamic resources and Sufi inspirations. This arrangement does not imply any division between the noble tradition of Islam, 14 centuries of spiritual discipline and exploration, and the rare mystical treasures of the Dervish orders that are sometimes referred to generically as Sufism. Sacred tradition is an uninterrupted continuum. Meister Eichhardt, among the consummate Christian mystics of Europe, whose strong teaching of omni-conscious unicity or identity with the divine is recognizably Sufi, ordered his most radical teachings during Sunday sermons to his German congregation. He would have been puzzled or even dismayed by the modern question, are you a Christian or mystic? Similarly inappropriate is the question I hear again and again, are you Muslim or Sufi? The most refined contemplative experience, the most profound teaching and effective guidance, emerge from the depth and remain within the embrace of carefully transmitted tradition. Part 1. Traditional Islamic Resources Concentrates on such subjects as the daily prayers, the Holy Quran, the oral traditions of Prophet, the sacred month of Ramadan. One billion Muslims on the planet today would experience agreement of heart with this presentation, regardless of subtle or obvious differences in religious and cultural emphasis. Part 2, Sufi Inspirations, brings the clear principles of Part 1 into a more radical expression, concentrating on distinctive Sufi themes, the path of love, the dervish circle of remembrance, the sheikh or mystic guide, the science of spiritual alchemy, the experience of paradise during earthly life, and entering the garden of essence beyond paradise. These remain deeply Islamic concerns explored as well by all noble wisdom traditions throughout history. Some contemporary Muslims may experience reservations about the teachings in part two, although they will recognize the rootedness of these teachings in the traditional soil of part one. The grandparents and great-grandparents of modern Muslims would have been able to attune more easily to the atmosphere of this book. There has been much cultural and spiritual erosion and consequent conservative entrenchment during the last hundred years of Islamic history. My mode of composition differs dramatically between these two parts of Adam from the Son of Knowledge. Part one was written in English by an author thoroughly schooled and widely read in that language. Part two is composed by the same author in Spanish for his community of dervishes in Mexico City. Writing as a neophyte in this beautiful Western Islamic language, perfumed by many centuries of high Muslim culture in Spain. The author assembled these poems and essays in the manner of collage, working from long lists of rich Spanish words and expressions, allowing them to come together spontaneously. 
This process of free association or dividedly guided association produced a form of linguistic expression that would not have been imaginable in Engl English. Incoherencies and errors were eliminated through the editorial assistance of Daniel Garcia Gay, who patiently instructed the author in the grammar nuance and rhythm of the Castilian idiom while editing the poems and essays composed in Spanish throughout this spontaneous process. Later, the author translated his own writings into English from Gathering Honey, Recollection de la Miel, Mexico City, 1989. The results, though somewhat strange to the ear, are unexpectedly revealing. This is why poems and essays are entitled Inspirations. The writings in Part 1 were also composed in the inspiring ambience of a mystical order, often during the sacred month of Ramadan, but they do not display the same intuitive reach as those composed in Spanish. The underlying fervor and creativity of Mexican culture, flowing through both Christian and pre-Hispanic wisdom and traditions, nourished the roots of these universal writings. The inherent musicality and fragrance of the Castilian tongue shaped not only the form but the content of these intoxicating songs and manifestos. The English translations in Part 2 benefited from the editorial assistance of Pamela White, who helped clarify and simplify the unconventional torrential language of the Spanish originals. Ms. White has examined with her careful editorial eye the entire manuscript of Adam from the Son of Knowledge, suggesting many subtle changes that have brought the writing to higher clarity and precision. She designed the book's attractive graphic form as well. I also wish to thank Sixtina Friedrich. Her scholarship in Arabic and Turkish combined with her sensitivity to Sufism has been an invaluable resource in ensuring accuracy throughout the book. The purposes of bringing together in one volume both traditional Islamic resources and contemporary Sufi inspirations is to demonstrate the essential mystical nature of Islam, which may be called mystical countenance. The term mystical is used here to indicate the indescribable intimacy between humanity and divinity, suggested by the Quranic phrases, near, nearer than near, and even nearer than that. And Allah is nearer to us than our central life vain. We are the people of nearness. Every sensitive Muslim is a dervish. Every unveiled human heart is mystical. It's my hope that part one and part two will be seen as fully interrelated and experienced as one essential taste. This demonstration of nearness will enable those both outside Islamic tradition to appreciate its astonishing depth. Perhaps the mere Adam from the Son of Knowledge will help those born and educated inside historical Islam to recover and transmit to future generations the profound social sophistication that belongs to their own global community, which has given birth to more authentic mystics in more diverse societies than any other world religion. Finally, this book intends to demonstrate that European and post-European culture is a fertile field for the spirit of universality, which is inherent in Islam and which is always propagated by enlightened sheikhs. Humanity is not entering a soulless technological wasteland as the English poet T.S. Eliot once warned, nor is any atheistic authoritarian system of government prevailing on the earth as once seemed almost inevitable, at least to Marxists. Planetary civilization is evolving instead into the experience of cosmic sacredness and unity so beautifully expressed in the Holy Quran where Allah calls humanity the sensitive caretaker of the earthly sphere. I attempt to unfold this Quranic vision more completely in Heart of the Quran, Theosophical Publishing House, 1988, which presents meditations on 991 verses from the Radiant Book of Reality. Allah Most High did not design Islam to suppress or supplant other revealed traditions, but to safeguard and elucidate their central teaching of omniconscious unicity. The truly human experience of oneness and its existential implication, compassion and service, is universal Islam, manifest in the heart of all traditions. Muhammad the Messenger, upon him be peace, is president of the Parliament of the Prophets. All the members of this parliament are perfect spiritual equals, sent to every nation in human history with the same essential message of oneness. Such is the integral view of the glorious Quran. Introduction Four Steps and Seven Levels My central responsibility in our dervish order is to offer initiation and to interpret dreams which indicate divine permission to receive initiation and to advance along the mystic path characterized by Nureddin Jurahi by means of 28 divine names. Among the 400 major branches of the dervish orders, the path is most often characterized by 8 divine names, sometimes by 12 and rarely by 18. That Pir Nureddin selected 28 indicates that he placed the divine seal upon the fullness of the mystic way of Islam. 
In the Jirahi order, one central initiation offers all the blessings of the path rather than a series of successive initiations that certain other orders prescribe. This initiation ceremony is not secret. It is often performed in the presence of visitors to the Tiki, the Dervish Meeting Hall. I have conducted this rite of entrance and sacrament of spiritual completeness for more than 500 sincere aspirants, so it has become natural to me, almost like breathing. This ceremony always remains a moving experience for the community as a whole, for myself, for the initiative, and for mature brothers or sisters who stand on each side of the new dervish, linking arms and helping the aspirant take these four ultimate steps. The initiation is called Taking Hand. It sacramentally replicates the historical event in the life of the Prophet when certain companions, already loyal to the holy way of life, ceremonially clasp his right hand, marking a vast intensification of their commitment. This act of taking hand creates a unique bond with the beloved Muhammad, beyond the respect and loyalty devout Muslims feel for their noble Prophet, upon him be peace. The right hand that is offered and received is this reenactment, therefore, is is ultimately the right hand of the Prophet. The right hand of the Sheikh is simply a conduit. Out of traditional Islamic courtesy, women initiates do not usually clasp the hand of the Sheikh, but both hold the same set of prayer beads. The ceremony is a mystic crowning in which the crown of light, usually given to the soul in paradise, is actually conferred here on earth. Those gifted by Allah with spiritual sight can perceive light, or even a crown of light, descending upon the head of the new dervish at the appropriate moment. The crown of paradise can be transmitted only in paradise. Therefore, paradise consciousness must become fully present during the initiation. The invisible crown is usually symbolized by the gift of a white cap to the men and a white or colored veil to the women, although many modern women prefer the cap. Receiving this crown enables one to experience paradise consciousness here and now, during one's prayers and even during the struggles of daily life. The initiated dervishes can now transmit at least a glimpse of paradise to their loved ones and colleagues, not verbally but directly, thereby elevating all humankind. The dervishes are not seeking their own spiritual bliss, but are clearly motivated by the longing to be of service to humanity and to their society in particular. The sheikh gestures to the experienced dervishes to help the initiate make the first step, beginning with the right foot. The Islamic greeting of peace, al salam alaykum, alaykum as salam are exchanged, and the sheikh welcomes the initiate to the dimension of Sharia, the depth of the sacred law. I welcome aspirants to this exalted level by reminding them that Sharia is essentially the repetition of the affirmation of unity, la ilaha illallah, externally or internally, verbally or non-verbally, with every breath, every step, every intention, and every perception. From this primary pillar of Islam, the other four pillars extend. I remind the aspirant that Sharia is the way of constant prayerfulness and delight in the prayers, the way of ceaseless acts of generosity and kindness to all beings as one family of consciousness, and the way of fasting, not just abstaining from food and drink from dawn to sunset during Ramadan, but fasting at all times, waking and sleeping, from limited conceptuality and limited emotionality. Finally, Sharia is the way of holy pilgrimage, but not just to the earthly Kaaba in the noble city of Mecca. Sharia is to remain constantly in the open and submitted state of a pilgrim while approaching the true Kaaba, the sacred heart of humanity, where the diamond of divine essence is concealed from the conventional gaze of the world. This first step, the noble Sharia, is obviously not just for beginners, nor is it left behind by the next three steps. The sheikh beckons the dervish to take another step, and the process is repeated as the aspirant is welcomed to the tariqah. This is the steeply ascending path the Holy Quran speaks about, the upward spiraling path that traverses the seven levels of consciousness. This is the path of profound purification, the path of mystic dreams and their inspired interpretation, the path of the joyful uproar and sweet companionship of the dervish lovers of truth. The Tariqa is a mystic tree. Its spreading roots, the beloved Prophet Muhammad, its noble trunk, the the sublime Ali. The great branches of this tree of Tariqa are the Purs, who have founded initiatory lineages in the smaller limbs and are all the noble sheikhs and sheikhs. The flower of all colors and fragrances that grow from these branches are the countless dervishes. The fruits are love and wisdom. The sap of this tree is the ecstasy of conscious union with reality. The sheikh gestures again and welcomes the aspirant to the third step, the Hakika. 
the peak of the mountain of light. Here the path disappears into the boundless green meadow of truth. Here in truth alone, the aspirant and the entire community are asked to gaze with the, the eyes of the heart. Now one can perceive only a shoreless ocean of light, indescribable and inconceivable, without any division or partition, without surface or depth. This ocean of divine light is not placid, but always filled with giant waves of love. The aspirant is now asked to focus on the eyes of the heart themselves, perceiving that they too are composed purely of divine light. This is the mystery of Narun al Nur, the light of Allah, within the light of Allah. The Sheikh beckons a fourth time, and the new dervish takes the final step into the white sheepskin, laid out in front of the kneeling guide to symbolize the sacrifice of the ego. This is the Ma'ifa, the courageous descent of the dervish soul from the peak of light into the valley of suffering, struggle, sacrifice, and responsibility, while retaining the conscious union with truth, characteristic of the third step. The culmination of wisdom is to become dust beneath the feet of humanity. Marifa is the selfless service of humankind and of creation as a whole, demonstrated by the beloved Jesus, upon him be peace, when he washed the feet of his disciples at the Last Supper, thereby opening their hearts and illuminating their minds. The hands of the new dervish now become the divine energies Rahman and Rahim, compassion and mercy. The heart of the dervish becomes divine justice and divine love. The breath of the dervish becomes divine life. The eyes of the dervish perceive only divine beauty. The mind of the dervish operates only with divine clarity and by the principle of divine unity. The special protector and guide for Sharia is the beloved Moses, the Tariqa, the beloved Jesus, for Hakika, the beloved Abraham, and the Marifa, the seal of messengers, the distributor of the light of prophecy of all hearts, the beloved Muhammad Mustafa. Upon him be peace. A distinct spiritual energy is experienced at each of the four steps. The harmony of all four is ineffably beautiful. Now the initiate kneels knee to knee with a shake, firmly clasping his right hand or prayer beads. The shake prays that the inconceivable divine mercy which is always descending as an invisible rain upon the planetary plane and upon the human heart, should now become visible to the eyes of the heart, cleansing the entire being of the initiative from all misunderstandings or partial understandings imposed since childhood by the limited society or arising from the narrow structures of the limited self. The Sheikh prays that even the slightest shadow of the negation of love should be swept away from this aspiring heart, and that it should be filled entirely with divine light. Together, the new dervish and the attending senior dervishes, along with the sheikh and the entire community, repeat 11 times the Arabic phrase, Estag Fairu Laha, which opens the mind entirely to the power of divine forgiveness. Whenever the sheikh welcomes a new dervish to the four steps or prays for the aspirant, his words become divine energy and bring directly into being before the eyes of the heart precisely what is described or prayed, not as an abstraction or as a pious wish, but as living reality. This is the mystery of divine creativity described by the Holy Quran. Allah Most High simply calls out the word of being, Be! And whatever He wills directly and effortlessly comes into being. At this point in the ancient ceremony of taking hand, the Quranic passage describing the original extent event in the desert of Arabia is melodiously chanted. I interpret the divine words to the new dervish in this way. When the lovers of love link to the right-hand side of their being with the prophet of love, upon him be peace. The mystic right hand of divine presence descended upon the linking in the linking. In this way, Allah confirms the original promise made to the noble Adam. This promise has been passed in an unbroken stream of light through 124,000 prophets to the beloved Muhammad of Arabia and transmitted from him through 14 centuries of mystic sheikhs. This is the promise of the soul's union with its Lord in the bridal chamber of divine love. The promise that even the veils of soul and Lord will vanish in the supreme realization of identity. Naming the place and year before the eyes of these honorable witnesses, I add that here and now this divine promise, which is good until the end of time, is again being confirmed. Now the affirmation of unity, La ilaha illallah, is repeated together by shake and aspirin seven times, once for each level of consciousness, the seventh repetition occurring at this level where only divine consciousness exists. The Sheikh concludes the seventh affirmation by intoning Muhammad Rasulullah Allah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. 
and the Dervish community begins to sing in a beautiful traditional melody the call of divine transcendence, Allahu Akbar, the affirmation of unity and praises of the Prophet. The Sheikh now confers the cap or veil, greeting it thrice with a noble kiss, touching it to eyes and forehead, then offering it to the new Dervish to greet in the same manner. The Sheikh places the traditional prayer beads of Islam into the right hand of the fully initiated brother or sister, symbolizing that every breath has now become equivalent to repeating one of the divine names. The astonishing fact of initiation is that the dervish has been transformed before our eyes into a person of perpetual prayer. His or her individual existence has now become ceaseless divine resemblance. The sheikh opens his palms and allows words of prayer to stream spontaneously through his heart to his lips. Whatever is appropriate for the initiate is now prayed in a graceful and uplifting manner, precisely as Allah has foreordained. I often conclude this long prayer by supplicating Allah Most High that our peer, Niruddin Jarahi, fix his spiritual gaze upon the heart of the new dervish, night and day, filling it with the light of universal Islam, that his saintly mother, Amina Taslima, transmit her purity and sanctity to this dervish, and that the representative of Pir Nuruddin to modern humanity, Mus Afir Ashki, fill the heart of this dervish with the exquisite wine of love. The newly invested dervish kisses the hands of the sheikh, exactly as if kissing the hand of Pir and a prophet, stands and makes the f- same four steps backwards, beginning with the left foot, which symbolizes the mystic way as the right foot symbolizes the sacred law. The atmosphere has now become light, joyous, and playful. I reassure the new brother or sister that these four steps backwards are not retreat or regression, that none of the spiritual riches of the four steps can be lost, but that one is simply returning to the existential situation to realize and actualize these sublime gifts that now remain radiant at the core of his or her being. We do not enter into the path to engage in religious fantasy, but to become more realistic, more free from self-deception, more uncompromising about truth. And I request the entire community to embrace the new dervish, or dervishes, for often friends or family members take the four steps together, arms linked in mutual loving support, hearts merged in the beautiful state of eternal companionship. In traditional Muslim circles, the sisters embrace the sisters and the brothers embrace the brothers, but among North American and Mexican dervishes, these culturally ingrained restrictions often cannot be imposed. After all, the dervishes are one family. They are tears and laughter. The divine light shining from the countenance of the newly unveiled dervish is an undeniable empirical fact. The most intimate teaching in our dervish order comes through spiritual dreams and their inspired interpretation. The sheikh does not deal with psychological or merely stress-reducing dreams, nor is there any fixed system of dream symbolism. Two dervishes came to our previous grand sheikh and reported the same dream, climbing a minaret and giving the call to prayer. To the first, the inspired interpreter commented, You're going on pilgrimage. Make preparations. To the second, he remarked, you have taken something that does not belong to you. Discover what that is and give it back. Before taking hand, the aspirant often receives a significant dream of divine permission, or in some cases, divine insistence. After taking hand, one usually experiences a dream, confirming that the ceremony was accepted by Allah. In the context of Islamic spirituality, no sacred rite is considered to be automatically effective. Rather, one must seek and await signs of the good pleasure of Allah the Most High. One of the fundamental teachings, shared by the various intertwining lineages of initiation that form the tree of Tariqah, concerns the seven levels of consciousness. Upon this crystal clear analysis of evolutionary levels, the esoteric teachings of Sufism are firmly based. One does not have to consult ancient textbooks to discover the perennial teaching of Sufism. This esoteric map of consciousness was transmitted with accuracy and clarity in a spiritual dream granted by Allah through the blessings of Pir and Nuruddin Jarahi to a Mexican girl of 12. Along with her mother, father, and younger brother, Rahima had participated in the ceremony of taking hand about a year before her extraordinary dream. While visiting Mesquita Maria de la Luz, the mosque of the mother of the prophet in Mexico City, where our order is led by a gifted and dedicated woman, Amina Taslima al-Jarahi, I was honored to hear and interpret this dream. In my role as guide, I have listened to thousands of profound dreams during the last 11 years. This one is among the most astonishing. A young girl with this simple natural imagery appropriate to her own psyche accurately pictured the most sophisticated esoteric teaching of Islamic mysticism. As I listened to her father, Abdul Qadir, translate his daughter's dream from English to Spanish. 
I began to realize what an immense gift this was to our order, for we hold in common the spiritual wealth of our dreams and their interpretations. The powerful blessing of a mystic dream does not belong exclusively to the individual dreamer. Its healing, integration, and illumination belong to the entire community. I believe that Rahima's blessed dream of the seven levels of consciousness belongs as well to the lovers of truth across the whole planet into the distant future. Rahima dreamed that she was guided by someone she did not recognize through a large house with seven floors. The ground floor was dirt. There were absolutely no signs of human habitation or refinement. This place was not even kept clean. The second floor was an extremely simple dwelling, bare wooden floor, bed, t chair, a table. It was kept clean and was attractive in its modest way. The third floor was a very comfortable home, according to modern standards. There were carpets, radio, television, refrigerator, and so forth. When Rahima was taken to the fourth floor, the fourth level of consciousness, she was amazed to find a brilliant palace. Marble floors, high ceilings, large gilded mirrors, beautiful antique furniture, precious ancient vases, and other works of art. At this point in the recounting of the dream, I began to realize that certain mysteries of the spiritual path, which remained vague to me, were about to be displayed in simple dramatic imagery. All who were present entered a mild state of ecstasy, a gift of the fourth level. Rahima continued speaking, calmly and confidently, without any self-consciousness. When the dreamer was guided to the fifth floor, she encountered total darkness filled with deep rumbling music that she, as a twelve-year-old, found rather unsettling. When taken to the sixth floor, she found an empty candle candlelit space where a circle of dervishes wearing white and kneeling on shapeskins were engaged in the ancient ceremony of divine remembrance. Arriving at the seventh floor, Rahima entered a brilliant sunlit room illuminated through large skylights and filled with lush green plants. No person was present, nor were there indications of human habitation. The golden light in the dark green of the leaves created a joyful, expansive feeling. Suddenly, one of the plants reached toward her with a long creeper, wrapped around her waist, and gently threw her out an open window. She fell with equal gentleness to the earth below, landing on her feet. Almost as an afterthought, Rahima mentioned that her guide took her back through the same sevenfold structure several times, so that she was perfectly clear about the various levels. Each time she was thrown out of the window again, I asked her how many times she ascended these floors. She thought carefully for a moment, then replied definitively four times. The interpretation of this dream can be extensive. I offered a seminar in Mexico City on the seven levels of consciousness, during which I spoke about this dream for several hours. The first level is the domineering self, basis for the aggressiveness, territoriality, and violent urge for survival that seriously threaten the coherence of our personhood, our society, and our planet. There's nothing intrinsically human here. There's no possibility for hospitality. There's not even the cleanliness that is essential for human dignity. Although most human beings experience disconcerting flashes of this domineering ego, very few persons remain focused on this level. Only war criminals and other enemies of humanity could be said to live primarily on the first level of consciousness. Nevertheless, there is nothing intrinsically evil about this first level. It provides a biological ground floor for human reality. Through this consciousness, the lungs breathe and the heart beats. The second floor in this dream represents the critical, or inquiring, self. Most of humanity is focused on this level, where basic human refinements are beginning to appear. This dream imagery has nothing to do with social standing or affluence. There are persons living in presidential palaces who are occupying the dirt floor of the first level of consciousness, as well as persons who live in thatched huts who are enjoying the glorious palace of the fourth level of consciousness. The evolutionary efforts carried on by the second level of the self can constitute the critique of the domineering ego, the critique of selfish impulses. The search is carried on here for truly human and humane values, for disciplined and fruitful ways of life. There are many dimensions within the second level of consciousness. They are all essentially positive, vulnerable, and evolutionary, unless they remain dominated by the first level, obviously or subtly. The third floor of this structure of consciousness is the fulfillment of our humanity. Human potential is here unfolded harmoniously. Perhaps the majority of human beings reach upper regions of the second level, but only excellent persons of goodwill become established at the third level. Here, ethical and religious ideals are in full flower. This level of development or awakening to our true nature is the real basis for civilization. Religion, art, education, science. Sincere seekers on this second level receive certain glimpses of the third level, but where one's awareness remains primarily focused is what counts for evolutionary development. In true traditional Sufi parlance, the third level is the fulfilled or satisfied self. 
One could reasonably inquire how could there be levels higher than the fulfillment of human aspirations to an excellent civilized existence. The four higher levels are the fruition of the mystic path of return. They are not, strictly speaking, part of human potential and human effort. They are the manifestation of divine reality through our human reality. One usually must reach the third level of consciousness to receive authentic initiation into a mystical order, or one may be li lifted by divine grace through his initiation into the third level. When one reaches the fourth level, divine attributes begin to manifest directly and adorn the human being. This is symbolized in Rahima's dream as, a, as rare works of craftsmanship and art. These manifestations are not, however, works of human hands, nor are they brought about by human efforts. The transition to the fourth level usually occurs after physical death in the realm of paradise consciousness. Only genuine mystics can generate enough spiritual intensity to enter this in the higher levels during earthly experience. Once again, we recognize that gifted persons on the third level, or even on the second level, may receive glorious intimations of the fourth level of consciousness, but to be established there is an entirely different order of experience. Not even all the members of a mystical order became established on the fourth level, which in traditional Sufi parlance is the tranquil self. The fifth level is that of mystic union, where no finite modes of thought or perception operate, hence the symbol of total darkness. The thunderous music in the dream represents the divine resonance, from which universes are taking shape and into which finite existence disappears again. This was the only floor in the dream structure that caused Rahima nervousness and concern, since his radiant blackness is so far from our ordinary self of, of experience. In, in the fifth level, in Sufi parlance, is the peaceful self. If we were to correlate the seven levels with the four steps, Sharia would be the third level, Tarika the fourth, and Hakika the fifth. The final two levels are, of consciousness are an expression of Marifa, the astonishing dimension of spiritual manifestation that lies beyond mystic union. On the fifth level, there is only truth in its resonance. On the sixth level, creation appears once more, not through beautiful divine manifestations as on the fourth level, but as the mystic crown, the sublime human form symbolized by the circle of dervishes. One surprising piece of good news brought by Rahima's dream is the confirmation that the ancient ceremony of Dakir, traditionally conducted by candlelight kneeling on sheepskins, actually affords the blessed dervishes in the circle a glimpse of the sixth level, although most of them may not even have become established on the fourth level. In the precious sacrament of Dakir, essential divine energies descend through the hearts and even through the physical bodies of the dervishes. Divine reality becomes visible and experienceable as human reality. In Sufi terminology, the sixth level is the complete self. The enigmatic seventh level of consciousness is a realm of brightness, clarity, subtle humor. The human form has been transcended, even as a mode of pure divine expression. Thus the seventh level resembles the fifth level in its absence of human reference. Yet here the imagery of light and luxurious growth replaces the imagery of mystic darkness. The human person of, of Rahima was not permitted to remain, but was removed instantly in a playful and humorous manner. My Sheikh Muzaffar Ashki used to comment simply, on the seventh level of consciousness, if you imagine that you exist, it is idolatry. By the dynamic golden greenness of supreme, supreme reality, all possibility of the idolatrous perception of duality is tossed out the window. The colors on the seventh level indicate why Nur ad-Din Jarahi designated a golden cap wrapped in green, green cloth as the turban of the order. Green is also the chosen color of the beloved messenger of Allah. In Sufi parlance, the seventh level is pure self. Rahima was taken through this symbolic dream structure four times, indicating that she, although only 12 years old, was already in communion with the fourth level of consciousness. As she grows older, she will have to practice spiritual discipline and experience intense yearning to become fully established on this fourth level and to progress further. The stream is itself one of those rare works of divine art that manifested in the palatial fourth realm in the floor of a dream. Her unknown guide was probably Nur ad-Din Jarahi, may his spirit be sanctified, whose intercessory power by the permission and foreknowledge of Allah tenderly opened the way for this amazing dream, which has now become a channel of spiritual energy and illumination for us all, her grateful brothers and sisters.
Thus concludes section 101 of Adam from the Son of Knowledge by Lex Hickson Nural Jarahi. Next time I will continue with section 102, part 1 traditional Islamic resources. I will see you then. Alam.